Hello everybody, this is Chuck from Theater and Stream. Because Sundays are usually reserved for prestige television. And if you are a fan of prestige television, February 9th, you know, this last Friday, you know, you might have been just a typical Friday, but for fans of HBO's procedural True Detective, it holds a, a great deal of significance, as it marked the 10-year anniversary of the airing of the most significant episode in the landmark first season. Episode 4, Who Goes There? It was a critical hour of television for the then-fledgling series, as it solidified the show's standing as a groundbreaking and reinvigorating example of the power of prestige television. It advanced the main character's quest to root out the brutal killer responsible for the ritualistic murder introduced in the pilot, opened doors to possibilities too dark for light to touch, and escalated the stakes thanks in part to its final act showcasing Rust's infiltration of a biker gang with a jaw-dropping one-shot sequence that, to this day, still hasn't been matched. Who Goes There was the hour that elevated True Detective's esteem, not only amongst critics, but also with a loyal and inquisitive audience caught up not only in the mystery of the show, but also in the various writers and inspirations showrunner and creator Nick Pizzolatto cribbed from to form the enigmatic mythology behind the murders central to its narrative, as well as the memorable monologues of Matthew McConaughey's Rust Cole. Watching the show itself was only a part of the larger experience of being an enjoyer of True Detective, as a great deal of the enjoyment came from dissecting and digging into the show, its use of symbolism and its embrace of ambiguity. There was a large contingent on the show's subreddit who believed completely that Rust himself was the killer, for example, amongst many other improbable theories that were quickly disabused as the show progressed to its finale. And while that finale may have left some fans wanting due to Pizzolatto leaving the larger implications of its revelations unexplored and shrouded in mystery, that just underlined the point behind the series, the often fruitless struggle to hold back the blackness within humanity, even if you were a little peeved that the Tuttle clan itself seemingly skated from any public justice and retribution, one could still know that the whole experience was worth it, and that Pizzolatto and director Kerry Joji Fukunaga and company had the story, characters, and other elements like atmosphere and tone completely within their grasp. Of course, the next seasons would fail to truly hit the ceiling that the first season and who goes there set for the show. However, Recent events have caused many within the fandom to return to the generally hated second season and reappraise it on its own merits. The LA setting may have lost the careful guiding hand of Fukunaga, but Pizzolatto still delivered on a Chinatown-style government corruption noir that had a fitting conclusion and utterly tragic fates for its protagonists. The third season, of course, was seen as a return to form for most of the fandom, and critics as Pizzolatto and the dream team of directors and consultants like Jeremy Saul Neer and the great David Milch crafted yet another kind of detective story, this time about missing children. The lead performances by Mahershala Ali and Stephen Dorff, while not as meme-worthy as Rust and Marty, hold their own as richly rewarding performances with a great deal of depth. So what exactly defines a season of True Detective? Protagonists with baggage that were often hard to like, alluring mysteries blanketed by grim darkness, but a clear appreciation for policing, detective work, as well as the vagaries that often go hand in hand with them. In True Detective, the people seeking the truth are often proven to be just as enigmatic as the mysteries they are investigating, imbued with a complexity one doesn't often see in procedural murder shows. After all that, we come to the frigid elephant in the room, because February 9th, 2024, marked the early release of the latest episode of True Detective's rebooted fourth season, created by Mexican filmmaker Isa Lopez. The unimaginative, predictable, incomprehensible, and frankly offensive Night Country. While I'm sure Miss Lopez meant well when she went along with HBO's decision to repurpose her pitch for an original series titled Night Country into a reboot of their dormant flagship franchise, the results have been middling at best and downright laugh-worthy when it isn't being eye-rollingly lame in its portrayal of the genre it's supposed to be a love letter to. If you had to see the penultimate episode of the season to see the writing on the wall, I'd argue you haven't been paying attention or you aren't asking the right fucking questions. 
It's safe to say, this season has fully cleared the caribou in lieu of jumping the shark, as each subsequent episode is a descent into insipid, identity political blather, pointless non sequitur plot lines that lead to nowhere, which is replete with characters who are beyond unlikable and unsympathetic to a fault. It would help if the principal leads were actually portrayed as effective and competent at their jobs, but that would get in the way of all the white boomer mom navel gazing going on. Instead of showcasing the intellect and intuition required to complete the task before them, the detectives of Night Country are pretty hopeless at their jobs, and they prove it with every twist and turn of Lopez's narrative. Rather than having complex and nuanced characters peeling back the layers of a crime, a place, and the people potentially involved in it, we are shown two detectives who seemingly lack all deductive reasoning. By all accounts, they should have had this case solved from the get-go. Pretty much every major discovery that moves the case forward in this season occurs off-screen, since Lopez elected to have our leads dump the real detective work off on the beleaguered Peter Pryor while they drive around and hallucinate about one-eyed polar bears and dead people. That kid is the only true detective in this lineup, and he did it all from his desk with a MacBook. It'd be hilarious if everyone involved in the show, and those taking part in weekly brainstorming sessions about its asinine plot, weren't all being so self-serious. The short and six episode season did Lopez no favors in this regard, as every episode battles with itself over whether to devote time to solving a mystery or exploring the uninteresting personal dramas of its characters. The consequence is a show that fails to deliver on any level, with reveals that are so inelegantly telegraphed that I personally had them clocked from the first episode. But according to Lopez herself, that was intentional, and it reveals just how off track her approach was to begin with. This is a far cry from Pizzolatto casually and subtly having the killer show up in an episode from the first season, and the power of the eventual revelation of his identity in the latter half. Instead, Lopez's choices craft a mystery that isn't one, with every player and potential clue clearly identified and laid out with all the subtlety of a brick. You'd have to be dense not to notice that the evil mining company is up to something no good, just as it's completely fucking obvious that John Hawk's character is clearly hiding something important about the Annie K case. The reality of Night Country beggars belief and stretches the credulity of anyone with a lick of awareness of what good detective work looks like, whether in the real world or in fiction, and how the real world would respond if there was as many verified stillbirths within a community as remote and small as Ennis is supposed to be. But the most egregious deviation for Lopez, was in revealing the truth to the audience, but not to the leads. Imagine a scene in any of the prior seasons basically laying everything out without having our detectives suss it out for themselves. Hawks' character basically gives a deathbed confession to his complicity directly to them. Its leads come off as incompetent rather than capable. Side characters like Pryor's wife are ridiculously hectoring and unreasonable, given her husband's job and the fact that a literal mass murder has occurred. In fact, the corpsicle matters less and less with every episode, and in one of the most egregious bits of nonsense that has ever happened in this dumb season, in episode 5, there's a scene where the evil mining lady and, you know, Clary Starling's boss sit down with her, and they tell her that, oh no, this was just a weather event. There was no murder here, except for the fact that there's supposedly a survivor running around out there that they were looking for with a bunch of hillbillies three episodes ago. Like, they don't even remember what they were doing. Every single second spent on Danvers' daughter is also insufferable, and a waste of space in the limited runtime available to bring other, more important threads to their conclusions. The constant needle drops of downshifted pop tunes were frustrating at the outset, but have proven to be quite infuriating and grating for me as the season progressed. Whoever the music supervisor on this show is needs to chill the fuck out. I miss T-Bone Burnett so much right now. The only joy to be found for myself and many others is in hate watching the show, which has only helped its ratings. But the attitude and response from Lopez and the cast regarding the negative reaction to their efforts hasn't helped the medicine go down. They've elected to follow the same program that Hollywood runs through whenever one of their reboot attempts is rebuffed for failing to live up to the promise of whatever source material they've chosen to wear as a skin suit. You'd think they'd learn that the Ghostbusters 2016 playbook of denigrating everything that came before and discounting any criticism as unfair and unfounded doesn't do anything to engender goodwill and amity from the people who supposedly are the audience for it. 
Lopez has responded by invoking every tired stereotype about the haters of her show and claimed in particular that the noise is just loser fanboys of season one standing in the way of the acclaim she believes her show deserves. It's hard to reconcile that stance with the myriad of lame and unnecessary Easter eggs and lore-breaking inclusions inserted into her project to grab connective tissue between her misbegotten creation and that very season. That could explain Pizzolatto's open bitterness and contempt for Night Country, and Lopez should be so shocked by how her inelegant and misguided appropriation of those elements has been received. From the spiral showing up literally at every opportunity, to even the lame explanation for what it means within the season of the show, when before it was just mysterious and vague and could be anything, to the Tuttle's upgrade from backwater occult political machine to a multinational corporation with tenuous ties to the evil mind, you almost forget that the inciting event and supposed central mystery of the season is a group of scientists who inexplicably were frozen into a Rat King. And like I mentioned before, the Rat King is just a footnote in the story, and it doesn't matter. Nothing matters, and it shows. The ones paying for it are the fans. Not only those who have had the season pegged from the beginning, but especially those misguided fools who have deluded themselves into thinking there's something to get out of it. It's hard to gauge whether it's cope, delusion, or simply a tolerance for mediocrity, but it is shocking how many people online are seemingly swept up in all this nonsense. There is nothing that is challenging about Night Country. Except, of course, finding some way to make it through an entire episode without chucking your remote through your TV. So that begs the question, who is this show for? It's for your mom. It's a lesser version of a modern subgenre, the Arctic set procedural murder show. From fortitude to the head to even the recent A Murder at the End of the World, this kind of thing is well-trodden ground, and Lopez delivers nothing we haven't seen before and seen done better by other people. I recommend you seek those shows out, Fortitude in particular, because each season is infinitely more satisfying and worth your time than a single second wasted on this unnecessary and frankly shameful entry in what once was the gold standard for the medium. If there is to be a fifth season of True Detective, one can only hope that everyone all the way up to the executives who foisted Night Country upon us in the first place have nothing to do with it at all. Thank you for listening um, and tuning in. We will see you at our usual time next week where we'll be wrapping up our retrospective on Karen Kusama with her film Destroyer. Take care. Thank you.